Okay. Uh, good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. It is our webinar where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Uh, the show is free and open to anyone to watch. Um, we do these sessions live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's okay. All of our previous uh, shows are available in the archives on our website. And um, we cover everything um, on the show, presentations, book reviews, little mini training sessions, interviews, um, basically anything that's related to libraries. Um, uh, we'll put it on the show. <laughs> um, and this morning we have on the line with us remotely from up in Omaha. Our, our speakers are remote today. Um, Bridget Kratt and Wendy uh, Grogene. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Yep, it's nice. well, it's Grogene, now Lowenstein. Lowenstein. Okay, yep. yes, right. I wasn't sure about the change. Yep. <laughs> Lowenstein. Um, and they are from University of Nebraska Omaha's Library Science Education Program. And um, they're going to be talking about us to us about preparing your students in your schools for uh, going to college. So I'll just hand over to you guys and you can take it away. Awesome, thank you. Um, and welcome to Easing Information Anxiety, Teaching Information Literacy Strategies and Skills for Co College Preparedness. I'm Wendy Lowenstein, um, formerly Wendy Grogene. And I am Bridget Kratt. Thank you for joining us. Wendy and I both have previous classroom and library teaching experiences in K-12 environments. And now we both currently work with both undergraduate and graduate candidates in the library education programs in the College of Ed here at UNO. Um, and the idea for this webinar came out of an ALA e-course that we took with Joanna Burkhart, who is the co-author of Teaching Information Literacy, 50 Standards-Based Exercises for College Students. The experience of the e-course really caused us to reflect on our previous teaching experiences at the K-12 level and our current teaching practices and information literacy skills at the post-secondary level. And I do want to put a little plug in. I just found out this morning that this ALA e-course is being offered again right now. I just received a notification. So it's, this is something of interest to you. You might want to check into it. And in this session, we're going to discuss information literacy concepts that school librarians need to cover with secondary students in order to prepare them for college. We call this revving up for research, and we will explain how this directly relates to the information literacy competency standards for higher education. The links to these standards is included in this presentation. I'll take you there now so you can see these standards and the 22 indicators. This whole site, first of all, is a wonderful resource, and the standards include an informative introduction. Uh, Wendy, I, I just want, need to interrupt a minute. Hi, this is Krista. Um, it's actually not going showing this the website. It's going to the other screen again. For, um. Oh, huh. okay. okay. Let's figure yeah. this out. That's all right. <laughs> um, our tech test worked perfectly. It did, good. yes. Um, our still says didn't on have the money. screen. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you see on our screen? It's, it's back to in the PowerPoint presentation like you were before on the very first um, first slide as, and as if it was frozen again just like it was before. Um, try and do what you did before where you um, undid, undid showing your screen and went back to it again. That seemed to fix it the first time. Okay. I'm going to pause it for a second. Yeah. And it is paused now. And I'm going to click back on it. And what do you see now? Because it does say on air showing my changed. screen. Well, I tell you what. Yeah. We're just going to pop out of the whole thing for a minute. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pause it again. We've actually um, mm -hmm. und undone our uh, second monitor to see if that mm -hmm. will solve the problem. Okay. Um, here, I'm going to pull back presenter control and rehand it to you guys again here. Just let me do, do, do. Okay, change presenter. Okay. Okay. Okay, and now go to the full screen of that again of the presentation. Yeah, and so now I'm seeing the slides. I guess I don't know what it's having 
issues with now. <laughs> Sorry. Well, if we uh, can see the website now, if mm -hmm. I take you there. Yep, now it's doing it, yep. Okay, so maybe just yeah, eliminating good. that second yeah. monitor will work out. <laughs> yeah. But that's no problem. It doesn't understand the here. monitor, yeah. <laughs> yep, oh, you're yeah, all good. I see the slides. Mm -hmm. I see the, right. the page now, yep. Perfect. Well, Sorry, and yeah. as you can see, uh, this source is a great um, piece of information that have not only the standards but an informative introduction for you to refer to. There's also an abundance of outcomes that can be used to measure student progress towards information literacy. So we're going to talk about the five Association of College and Research Libraries, or ACRL, standards. And these include standard one, the information literate student determines the nature and extent of the information needed. Standard two, the information literate student accesses needed information effectively and efficiently. Standard three, the information literate student evaluates information and its sources critically and incorporates selected information into his or her knowledge base and value system. Standard four, the information literate student individually or as a member of a group uses information effectively to accomplish a specific purpose. And standard five, the information literate student understands many of the economic, legal, and social issues surrounding the use of information and accesses and uses information ethically and legally. During this presentation, we will look at indicators, outcomes, and activities that align to each of these standards. We really hope that you'll be able to leave this webinar with some activities and ideas that you can use as soon as tomorrow in your libraries. As we look deeper at these standards, we realized that, that they included steps and components of research processes and inquiry models that you may already be familiar with. These include the Eisenberg and Berkowitz Big Six, the Stripling Model of Inquiry, the McKenzie Research Cycle, and others. Um, I just wanted to take you quickly to the Big Six site that I use quite often at both the elementary and high school libraries that I worked at. On this site, it walks you through, um, there's tons of resources, but also it'll walk you through the six steps of research um, that are involved in the Big Six, of course. Um, step one being task definition, where students and researchers uh, will identify the problem and identify, identify the information that they need. Um, step two is where they will um, determine all the possible resources and select the best resources to solve their problem. Step three is when they physically um, locate the resources either in print or digital. And step four is when they engage with these resources to take notes and organize their information. Step five is the synthesis where they're gathering together all of the information and putting it into a product or a presentation. And step six is when um, both the teacher will evaluate the product in the process and also the student will self-evaluate their product in the process. Again, this resource is a wonderful site for students, teachers, and school librarians. And I'm going to take a minute to walk you through um, two other resources that we use quite a bit when we're teaching research skills. And this will be the Stripling Model of Inquiry and the McKenzie Research Cycle. And the Stripling Model of Inquiry, there are several places that you can access this information, but I chose to take you to the Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources site because, again, this is a, a great way to incorporate those primary sources um, and show you how you can connect this model to doing that. And with um, Barbara Stripling's model, basically you kind of start out with connecting and wondering. You're thinking about how this connects to knowledge that you already have, and you start to develop some questions. Um, you then go into where you will begin to investigate, and you're going to find and evaluate information. From that, you'll cons construct some new knowledge and begin to apply that understanding in a new context. Um, just like with the um, Big Six, you're just going to reflect on your learning, and you're going to be begin to ask some new questions, which from there you go back and connect to your previous knowledge. What I really like about this is it's not a linear process at all, but really very cyclical, and you can see how you can go back and forth between the components of that. Um, the other one that we're going to take a look at, and there are many, many out there, um, is the McKenzie Research Cycle. And Jamie McKenzie is kind of a guru um, when it comes to the importance of questions and questioning with our students. He has several books out right now. We have used some in our coursework here at UNO. Um, but his
Uh, Bridget uh, and Wendy, um, I just need to interrupt a second. This is Krista. Um, we seem to have lost your sound. Um, maybe you've hit a button or hit mute or something. Um, you've cut out on the sound. Wendy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. You got dumped, it looks like. Yes, we did. Sometimes our best laid plans. <laughs> okay. Um, we want to try and pick up again. I can switch over back to you again. Is your connection okay now, or we're not sure? We'll just see what happens. <laughs> well, we're going to try okay. it from my computer. Okay. All right. Hold on a sec. I will make you presenter like I did before. And should be able to grab the pop-up there. Yeah, we're on our computers here. Do you know at what point you lost us? Because we were just talking. Um, yes, you were talking about the, uh, you're on the questioning.org website. You just started showing that one. Okay, so you guys didn't miss much. So, yep. Yeah. We were just and, talking about ourselves then. Yeah, and the sound died, and then your screen froze, and I was trying to talk to, back to you, and I kind of figured out that they must have completely lost connection, and that's what's going on here. So, okay, there, yep. Yeah. I'm going to need just one second. Yeah, no problem. Because we're switching everything over on our laptops now. Because so. mm -hmm. I can um, do my... Okay. But All I'm right. Not, I'm not... My script's not pulling up. I got some time. All right. So am I live yet? Um, it looks like you are. You're on the... I'm still seeing the Instagram website yes. doing that's it. Where, that's thing. where I want to be. Okay. Okay. That's where you're on then. Yep. That's what you're showing. And it looks like it's moving around and doing some stuff. So you still have a live connection. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to um, show you... Uh, just grab one of Martin's. I'm going to show you instagrock.com. I apologize for our technical difficulties today. Um, if you are to just type in any subject that you are wanting to research, um, you don't have to create an account for this. You can. And there are certain benefits to creating an account. Um, but what it does is it pulls up subtopics on the topic that you are um, researching. And then if you are interested in other subtopics, then you click on that subtopic and it breaks that topic down into more subtopics and you're in subtopic heaven. Um, I'm going to go back to weather and I also want to show you um, and call your attention to some other um, to some other qualities of the site that I like. For example, you'll notice here the key facts. The key facts lists a ton of of key facts that you um, may or may not be interested. Also notice for students, vocabulary terms are highlighted so they can click on those and learn more about the vocabulary terms. They can delete the key facts. And also notice this little pin right here. If I like this fact, I can click that pin. It'll add it to my diagram, but then it'll also add it to my journal. Um, this will be handy when you, the students get a little bit further in the note-taking process. They can start their own journal, pull over facts that they like or they think are relevant. Notice it also pulled over the resource that that fact came from. And I can also add my own notes. Um, okay. Um, I can also add my own notes to this journal as well. Please notice that students can either print this, so again, they don't have to create an account. They can email this to the students. Or also, this journal can be connected to Edmodo if you use Edmodo in the classroom. To go back to the graph, you just simply click the graph tab. So students can add, um, add to their uh, subtopics list. They can find further subtopics. They can take notes on the site. And also, very quickly, too, notice there are websites uh, that you can um, access. There are videos and images on your topic if you have more visual and uh, audio learners. Also, there are quizzes on there for students to check their knowledge and a glossary of terms as well um, if there are some terms that students are unsure about. And the last thing I want to share with you, because there's so much on this site, uh, this is my favorite aspect, but I'm going to move this button. And what this button does is it um, changes the level of difficulty of the concepts and terms and vocabulary. So I went all the way to the, um, to the left, and that, if you noticed, really simplified the concepts in the vocabulary. If I go all the way to the right, it makes the concepts a little more difficult. If I go in the middle, it's in the middle range. So regardless if you're um, teaching at the high school, not all of your students are reading at the high school level, and this is also a great tool um, for ELL students as well. Um, 
the brain, this brainstorming process and using this site during the brainstorming process would be essential to providing key facts about the topic. It will also help students learn terminology and synonyms that can assist them in developing their research question. You know, we realize that it's common to work with a predetermined uh, curriculum-based research objective. That happens quite a bit. However, we also know that a major goal is for our students to really start formulating their own higher-level questions based on their research interests. Since essential questions are crucial to successful research, it may be necessary to guide students through this process. And so we've come up with this activity um, that can help you do that. By having students complete a topic triangle in which they narrow down their focus, they are better able to formulate a higher level thinking question. For example, a topic like environmental awareness is a bit too broad. Instead, students could narrow this down further to uh, to narrow their topic. And for example, if I use Instagraph before this, it'll help me find those um, narrow subtopics that they can use. Um, and then specify the topic even further uh, to focus on acid rain as a component of pollution and further specifying it to acid rain in the United States. From here, we would be able to, or students would be able to formulate a higher level research question such as, drumroll please, what is the connection between acid rain and air quality in the Midwest. Different types of questions can help refine and shape the direction of students' research. And you, I showed you earlier that McKenzie site, and really um, he does an amazing job of kind of breaking down all the different types of questions that are still very higher level that our students can be asking. So you can see how the research question that we ask can be changed and modified by focusing on either cause and effect so what effect does acid rain have on agriculture in the U.S.? Again, we're being very specific. Comparison, how does acid rain in the affect the environment in the eastern United States compared to the western United States? A measuring type question, to what extent has acid rain impacted agriculture production in the last 50 years? Or even a process type question, how can acid rain be monitored in order to educate about the dangers? These activities meet ACRL Standard 1, Indicator 1, in which the information literate student defines and articulates the need for information. By exploring information and defining and modifying information to achieve a manageable focus, we are really beginning to rev up for research at this point. Once students have narrowed their topic and created a higher level thinking question uh, to research, what do you do next? Well, ACRL Standard 1 Indicator 2 is the information literate student identifies a variety of types of formats of potential sources for information. To do this, they need to consider what information they need and where they will find it. The sources of information and the specific information selected will be determined by that information need. And we all know that not every information source is equal or necessary or good. So in order for our students to know which resources to use, they need to first know which resources are available to them. Up to this point, we've been talking about revving up for research by narrow downing a topic, narrowing down a topic, and developing a higher level research question. However, long before this revving up for research begins, students need to be aware of all the resources a library has to offer. This can and should be done throughout the school year and includes both print and digital resources you need to consider whether or not your library has subscription databases, magazines, a print reference, reference section, a copy of textbooks used for curriculum available for your students and teachers to use in your library. Keep in mind if your school does not have a budget for subscription databases, there is an option for you. And for those of you obviously joining us from Nebraska, this one would or should look familiar. So. Nebraska Access is a great, great resource. Thank you, Krista and MLC. Um, for those of you that are not in our state, we really encourage you to check with your own state library commission to see what's available. With Nebraska Access, we have databases that are available to everyone in the state. And when you um, are from a school site or a public library site, there's no login needing um, the IP address. I believe it is read through the IP address but you can see that we have all of these resources at our fingertips. And I will tell you that especially um, when I'm looking at selecting sources um, for that support information literacy, I really look at books and print and nonfiction connection. 
Um, they allow me to break things down um, by topic, by grade level, by format. I, I get full professional reviews. Um, so on the back end, these are the kind of sources that I'm providing for students who are then searching for information. But again, we have all these databases, including Omnifile Full Text Select, where you'll get full text articles. Of course, the classroom teacher and school librarian first need to discuss which types of resources the students can and will be able to use during the research process. And oftentimes, these are determined by standards, target objectives, and any other learning outcomes of your district. So an activity students could create, uh, could do is to create a concept map like this. And this would allow them to brainstorm and visualize all possible sources of information before they even begin their search for credible and authoritative sources. Much like they narrowed down their research topic into a higher level thinking question, they really need to narrow down all possible sources of information to those that will best help them answer that question. You know, we don't want to get them too far ahead in the process. They need to think about what's best going to help me. And by having a system for organizing information, they can identify gaps to determine if they need to re revise. Um, and this is actually meeting st uh, ACRL Standard 2 Indicator 1, the information literate student selects the most appropriate investigative methods or information retrieval systems for accessing the needed information. With this type of activity, students are really beginning to develop their plan for research. And we created this graphic organizer just on Microsoft Word SmartArt. Once the possible resources have been determined, we would then move into selecting the best resources, which is Standard 2, Indicator 2, the information literate student constructs and implements effectively designed search strategies. One type of activity that leads students through the evaluation process would be for them to create a table like this. So here, students are determining the quality of information for a variety of sources because they're going to start considering the purpose, the audience, the authority, credibility, currency, and accuracy. Um, they're also considering if the source is primary information in its original form or first-hand accounts. And again, I took you to Library of Congress earlier, which has just a wealth of information here. Or secondary, removed from the original source. And you know, with your research projects, there's oftentimes going to be a combination of the two. Students are ultimately asking if the source that they are looking at provides them with high quality information and if the source provides the information that is useful in answering their research question. Once a topic, question, and possible sources for searching information have been identified, the next step would be to determine key words for conducting the research. Students frequently attempt to use their research question to search for information, meaning they type their question in the Google search box, which can lead to frustrating and an overwhelming amount of resorts, results that leads to their information anxiety. To help students select keywords that will allow them to successfully locate information relating to their topic in question, we recommend an activity like this. So here we have a pretty uh, simple search term guide that we created just using tables in Microsoft Word again. By creating a search term guide like this one, um, students can better identify concepts, keywords, terms, and synonyms of words that become their first round of search terms. And again, the Instagoc site that Wendy demonstrated earlier can also help with this. So for example, we've been talking about the effects of acid rain on, and connections to air quality in the Midwest. Since that's our research question, then our table could look like this. Concept one is acid rain. And if you think back, again, to that Instagram, we had some synonyms that they were giving us. So a good starting point for possible keywords might be wet deposition and sulfur dioxide. Concept two is air quality. And other search terms here might include smog or ozone. And concept three is the Midwest. Other search terms here might include Nebraska or Great Plains. You'll notice that within each concept, students will be using the Boolean operator of OR. This will retrieve all records that have either term. Between each concept, the students would be using the Boolean operator of AND. This will retrieve all records that include both terms in the same record. Students can also use the word NOT, which would eliminate any records that would contain a term that they know would not be useful to their research. This activity and process will save a lot of time they would otherwise spend sorting through resources and records that would not be helpful to answering the research question. And saving time, as we all know, can alleviate anxiety. 
This addresses the ACRL Standard 2 Indicator 4. The information literate student refines the search strategy if necessary. So if you're not familiar with Boolean searching, there's a great resource that can walk you through this. It's called a primer in Boolean logic. And I'm going to take you there because it's much easier to understand the process when you can kind of see how it works. So again, our main terms here are or, and, and not. And the um, example that they use here is college. And so someone is searching for information on college. But by using the uh, Boolean operator of or, it will also pull up university. And what they're going to do here is it's going to um, look at all records that contain the word college. It's going to look at all records that contain the word university. And it's going to look at all records that contain both college and university. So by using the operator of OR, it's actually going to increase the number of results. And here is an example of doing it with three different terms. When you use the operator of AND, um, you're going to retrieve records which both of the search terms are present. So um, here the example is poverty and crime. If you type in both the poverty and crime, you're going to get this in the shaded area. Okay? It's not going to retrieve anything that just has poverty or just has crime, but only those records that have both in the um, information. And so that's going to limit the number of results. And then the final example is the not logic, logic. And here they're using cats and dogs, but they actually want cats, not dogs. So it's not going to pull up anything that has cats and dogs. It's not going to pull up anything that has dogs. It's only going to pull up those information that um, is just specific to cats. And again, here you're actually limiting the uh, number of hits. Um, students are really starting to rev up for research now. They have identified a topic. They've narrowed it down. They've developed a research question. They determine possible sources available, and they develop search terms to use when conducting their research. We all know at this point it's tempting for them to type those terms into Google and hit the search button. Um, if we've you know, prevented them from typing their research question in, they still might want to be typing all of that in. And as Wendy mentioned, it's going to yield millions of hits. So we suggest the following activity so students can experience the difference between information found through searching the web and information found in the library's databases. There are two parts to this exercise. In the first part, on the top, students will look up their topic in both Google and in the library's general periodical database. They should be encouraged to use the search terms with OR, AND, and NOT, as described earlier, and include this in the first column. They would then record the number of hits and indicate how the results were organized. Next, students would list the types of materials that were found. In the second part of this exercise, students will identify the best sources of information and provide a description of the information and the authority of the author. The goal of this type of exercise is for students to understand that a library database will yield much more information-rich results with less time and effort and anxiety, and that conducting the same search on the web, not so much. It's really an opportunity to discuss how Google, although yielding millions of results, and you know, usually their first choice, is really only scratching the surface. It won't yield and it can't index information on the deep web, that information that is actually hidden within databases. And typically the information that's best going to help answer that research question. So this type of activity addresses ACRL Standard 2, Indicator 5. The information literate student extracts, records, and manages the information and its sources. All right, students are now ready to start reading information and selecting main ideas and analyzing the structure and logic of supporting arguments and methods. Here we are beginning to move on to ACRL Standard 3. The information literate student evaluates information and its sources critically and incorporates selected information into his or her knowledge base and value system. This is really all about note-taking. There are several strategies that can be used when teaching this concept. ABC Lu, mind maps, and tables. So some of you, maybe many of you, are probably familiar with the acronym ABC Lu. This A stands for abbreviate, B stands for bullet points, C stands for what I like to call cell phone language because I think it's a little bit more current than uh, caveman language. Lists, we have our L is for lists. O, one word for many, 
and you use your own words. And this is really an excellent mnemonic device that students can easily remember so they're selecting and using information ethically. And I just want to take you to a quick um, site that we really like. And even if, when you're teaching um, high school students that are preparing for college, I don't think they're too old for Grammar Granny. Grammar Granny always has some great content on this site. Um, but you'll notice that she does uh, break down this ABC Lou, ABC Lou process. And so it really kind of gives them some, some good examples. You know, something like United States of America, just put U.S. Bullets, you know, with the example of baseball, bullet point those information. So nine players, everybody plays both offense and defense, and so on. She has a really great exercise on here that you might try, and I think even our high school students would really enjoy um, being the caveman and having them read a resource or hear a resource or have someone, um, even a, a TV report, and they have to practice the skill of cell phone language. Um, she even wants them dressed up in a sheet to look like, I think, Fred Flintstone. I think another way, too, for caveman language would also be um, having them take their notes in tweets. So that would really require yeah. them to uh, lower the amount of characters and terms mm -hmm. they use when they take notes. Great point. 140 characters or less. Yep. Um, again, lists, one word for several. Be thrifty. Um, you don't want to get bogged down. And finally, use your own words. And this is going to come up here again later when we start really uh, diving into ethical use. Um, a mind map also works well and helps students conceptualize and visualize important points and subtopics to focus on. There are several free online tools that can help in this process, including Instagram that I previously showed you, but I also wanted to take you to Bubble S uh, and show you how this can be used. Bubble S is a free site, does not require um, a login or a username or a password. You can have a username or password to save it. Uh, Bubble S pretty much takes you to the screen and literally you just start here. Right now my son is studying about weather in his class. Uh, you just type in the main concept and if you want to make uh, concepts to go off of your main point, um, you can type that in and you just keep going to town. I'm going to put types of weather, and also one thing that I know, and you can keep going and keep adding your concepts and adding more and more notes, but again, now I've got types of clouds, now I'm going to add my notes off of this bubble, and oh, wait a minute, it's the same color. One thing that I really like, and I know the kids enjoy too, is you can change the color as well and make this even more visual for them to keep building and taking notes. And also this will help them easily transition into the writing process when they've got their main ideas and their supporting details in different colors and layered as well too. This is a really visual, graphic way to help students take notes and then see how the information can very easily be transformed into an essay or a final product. Okay. Um, Bubble S is one that I like, but there are also other graphic um, organizer creators. Poplet is another one, and then we also have demonstrated some smart art and Microsoft Word as well, too. That does not require internet. And um, creating tables are really also an efficient way to help students arrange information for note taking. You know, a simple table like this allows students to focus on the main ideas and organize the information they're extracting from their sources. So again, if you take our example of the connections between acid rain and air quality in the Midwest, we would have acid rain, air quality, and Midwest in our columns. And then in the rows, we might be looking at causes, regulations, and possibly researchers in the field. It's really imperative to expose students to a variety of tools and note-taking strategies. So one way is not going to fit everyone. This way, they um, are really better prepared for the post-secondary environment. They can select the tools and strategies that work best for them and their learning style. All of these note-taking tools and strategies that we've addressed, um, sh or we've shared at address ACRL Standard 3 Indicator 1, the information literate student summarizes the main ideas to be extracted from the information gathered, as well as Indicator 3, the information literate student synthesizes main ideas to construct new concepts. At this point in research, students are really beginning to recognize the interrelationships among concepts and should be thinking about how to synthesize this information into a final product. This step is crucial as students really need a tool and method to help them put the information into their own words, thus avoiding plagiarism. 
The next step is to begin drawing conclusions based on the information they have gathered and integrate this new information with their previous knowledge. This is ACRL Standard 4. The information literate student, individually or as a member of a group, uses information to effectively accomplish a specific purpose. There are many, many, many ways that our students can demonstrate mastery of a concept. And oftentimes we realize they're going to have a research paper because they're required to write a thesis statement, have supporting paragraphs, and a conclusion. Um, however, there are several Web 2.0 tools that would also allow students to present and share their research findings in a unique way that requires them to go beyond basic knowledge and comprehension of a topic. These also allow students to tap into their creative side. Um, these tools can include Animoto, Glockster, Prezi, SlideShare, VoiceThread. There are many, many more. And you can access information on these and many more at the um, AASL's site for best websites for teaching and learning. And I'm going to take you there quickly just so you can see how um, they have actually broken it down for us by these big concepts. So media sharing, digital storytelling, managing and organizing, social networking, content resources, and curriculum and collaboration. And you might think, well, how is that going to how does that allow them to do a final product? Well, when you look in here at some of these um, the standards, they're, they're talking about using information tools to organize and display knowledge and understanding in ways that others can view and assess. Um, down here, and here's Poplet even, that Wendy was just talking about, digital storytelling, creative and artistic formats to express personal learning, um, managing and organizing tools. And social networking and communication, here they're really sharing and uh, what the information that they gather. So we encourage you to uh, check out this ASL website. And again, this active link is going to be on the presentation for you to do that. OK. Um, if students have a choice in how they represent their new knowledge, it is important for them to choose a communication medium and format that best supports the purposes of their product or performance, and also the intended audience. They also need to understand many of the economic, legal, and social issues surrounding the use of information and access and use of information eth ethically and legally. This is ACRL Standard 5. Throughout this process, students have been collecting, organizing, synthesizing data from various sources. They've been critical and they've been creative thinkers as they brainstorm, they analyze sources, and they question group and individual assumptions. Our goal is that they have also been ethical throughout this process. An activity that might check this ethical use can take place before the students ever submit their final product. And there are many free resources that help school librarians and classroom teachers teach the important concept of copyright and fair use. Uh, these include online interactive tutorials and quizzes from Teaching Copyright, uh, from the Copyright site. There's one called Copyright with Carlos and Eddie that I, I like. It's a couple of animated characters and um, the students can really relate to. There are sliders and spinners from the United States Copyright Office. There are just plenty of uh, resources out there for us. And they help engage students in authentic learning experiences and help them understand the implications for using the work of others. But by making sure students understand and follow the guidelines for copyright and fair use, this will address Standard 5, Indicator 1. The information literate student understands many of the ethical, legal, and socioeconomic issues surrounding information and information technology. And this also addresses Standard 5, Indicator 2. The information literate student follows laws, regulations, institutional policies, and etiquette related to the access and use of information resources. Once our students have a better understanding of the implications for using the work of others and are familiar with the why for citing sources, they now need to understand the how for citing those sources. Although this step in the information literacy process can be anxiety producing, it has actually been made much easier through the use of technology. Many, if not all of the common databases in our schools have citation builders built right into their features. Students simply click a button to decide the format for the citation, for example, APA or MLA, and the database will provide a citation. However, for sources of information take from, taken from other online searches and print materials, a terrific option for building citations would be easybib.com. And let me take you there just quickly, very quickly. As you can see here, uh, you have the options, or students have the option of citing a website, a book, Okay. Um, notice here they can just type in the title ISBN, 
a great way to teach them about ISBN, newspaper, journal, database, and there's even more. Um, the most useful I find and the easiest to do is just by citing a website. All they have to do is copy and paste a website URL um, into the resource, into EasyBib, click Cite This, and it will cite the website. It also it will generate a citation for you to copy and paste into a document, but it will also keep a running record um, if you want to just create your whole um, Works Cited page here on this website. Again, nice and simple. Our students have now reached the last of the indicators for Standard 5, which is Indicator 3. The information literate student acknowledges the use of information sources in communicating the product or performance. So through this whole process, our students have narrowed down their topic, they formed a research question, they've determined possible sources of information, they have selected the best sources that are going to help answer their research question, they've located and they've extracted information from within in those sources to take notes and they've organized it, and they've put their information in their own words to create a product, they've given their citations, and they've given credit to the sources. They've demonstrated the skills of information literacy. Uh, however, they are not quite done. We don't want our students to hand in their product and move on to the next project or assignment. An essential 21st century skill is for our students to evaluate and reflect on both the product for effectiveness and the research process that they use for efficiency. Although this is not addressed in the ACRL standards, it is addressed in both the American Association of School Librarian Standards for the 21st Century Learner and the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, and also it is a sixth step in the Big Six research process. As well as uh, one of the uh, components of the Stripling model. One way to do this is to have students complete a self-evaluation form. Some example questions you may have students consider during this process could be, what did I learn about my topic that I didn't know before? What source or type of source did I find useful that I've never used before? Why was this great and how did I find this resource? Which areas and section of the project were the most difficult for me to complete and why? Which part of the research process did I most enjoy? And what, what would you or the student do differently the next time? I often like to capture that last one so students can um, think about this the next time they research. Remember, research is not always linear. It is not always neat and clean. It is cyclical and sometimes is messy. However, there is still a process of steps we must go through as we guide our students towards becoming information literate. It is imperative that we work together with our classroom and content area teachers to ensure our students recognize when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate, and effectively use this needed information. As the Association of College and Research Libraries tells us, information literacy forms the basis for lifelong learning. It's common to all disciplines, to all learning environments, and to all levels of education. It enables learners to master content and extend their investigations, become more self-directed, and assume greater control over their own learning. And as school librarians, that is really our ultimate goal. So, thank you for joining us today and hanging with us through our technical difficulties. It is rather silly as we're sitting here with four screens in front of us <laughs> on different computers. Um, we hope you are able to incorporate some of the activities or ideas we've suggested into your next collaborative project with your classroom and content area teachers. We also would like to leave you with this thought from the resource Faculty Focus. An interdisciplinary effort gives students ample opportunities to practice and develop their writing and research skills. The cumulative effect of this approach not only benefits faculty, but our students seem to appreciate and feel less intimidated working within this method as well. So let's work together to ease information anxiety and I'll go, go rev up, up for research. research. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't know how much time we have for questions, but we'll gladly take them. Oh, yeah, no problem. Thank you very much, Bridget and Wendy. Um, yes, we will have time for questions, of course, um, since we had that, you know, break in the middle. <laughs> um, it's not a problem if we go over. We lose too much. I think we mm -hmm. kind of caught you up once our technical difficulties were resolved. And Wendy wasn't mm -hmm. kidding. We had four different screens going, and <laughs> things looked right on our end. But oh, I know. <laughs> Yay. Modern technology is just a wonderful thing when it works, yes. as is. 
commonly said. Um, if anybody does have any questions, comments, uh, suggestions for how you do things in your um, library or schools, um, type them into the questions section. Um, we do have one comment that came through and we were having the technical issues and I saved it just to let you know that um, someone did, Maria Francesca did say, it's a definitely a wonderful topic, well researched and presented so far. <laughs> um, so she knew it was going good when you started. <laughs> That's um, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just some thanks coming through. Um, we will have the record. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go and ahead. Michelle Nichol is still on. Thank you for calling me. <laughs> she actually called me to tell oh, me that, she? We, <laughs> that we lost contact because we're just chatting away, thinking everything's mm -hmm. going fine. So. I did try and call as well. I was assuming you're probably not answering on purpose because you were you know, doing your session. That's what I do. <laughs> um, we will have the recording up. Um, the 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 part when we were we lost connection we'll edit that out so we'll have a, a easier flow through the whole thing um, all the PowerPoint presentation for anyone who's wondering the full presentation will be posted up as well with it um, Bridget or Wendy will be emailing that to me um, when we get off the line here and um, the links that were mentioned in the presentation as you saw they are hot links right from there as well I am also going to be adding them some of them are already in there to the Commission's delicious account so you'll have a, a quick link to all of those um, websites and everything that were mentioned as well so we'll have all that. Doesn't look like any, um, while I was chatting away here, babbling away, doesn't look like any actual questions have come through. Just a bunch of really thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the presentations. Well, we appreciate it. Hopefully there's some activities that they can turn around and take today and use tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I, I really enjoyed it. It was very good. I wish I had some of these kind of skills more. When I was in college, um, I kind of just flailed around as best as I could, I think, with some of these things, but not anything officially taught to me as here's how is the right way to do it. I think I fell by accident <laughs> into some of these um, skills and processes. Yep, and that's what so. that's what we're seeing here with our candidates too. And it's just nice mm. for them to be exposed to as many um, as many different processes and skills and strategies. So then they have some mm. tools in their toolkit to pull out when they're faced with a big project once mm. they get up to the post secondary environment. Absolutely, because everything changes then. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much then, um, Bridget and Wendy. Um, it was great to have you on. I'm glad we were able to get the. Uh, technical issues resolved so we can um, get the full recording here and the full show going. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, pull back uh, presenter control here again. And, and I will send um, on the PowerPoint that I send you, Krista, it will mm -hmm. include our contact information as well. Um, we'll we're going to add that to that last slide in case anybody wants to get in touch with us. Okay, great. Absolutely. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending this morning, and thank you for holding th out through our technical difficulties. Um, that will wrap it up for this morning's show. Um, hopefully you'll join us next week um, for next week's Encompass Live, which is our monthly tech talk. Once a month, Michael Sowers, who's the technology innovation librarian here at the Library Commission, comes on and does a tech talk. Um, this month, however, we're doing something a little different. He's actually not going to be on the show. He is traveling down to... Um, Kansas to um, attend the Northeast Kansas Library Systems Technology and Innovation Day and what we are going to be doing then is um, instead of him doing an ep actual episode he is going to be we're going to be um, live broadcasting their opening keynote from Cynthia, du Cynthia Dutenhofer from Central Methodist University in Missouri um, will be on. This will be at a special time since it, they are we're doing it with their schedule. It will not be at 10 a.m. It will be an hour earlier at 9 a.m. Central Time. So be aware of that. As you can see, I've got some notes here for that. Um, so it will be a special time um, with a special broadcast that we'll be doing next week. Um, and if you are interested in any other learning opportunities, we want to bring your attention to our Nebraska Learners 2.0 program. This is a 23 Things style program that we do here in Nebraska uh, for any Nebraska library staff. Um, you can learn different um, Every month we put up a new uh, technology or website or service that you can learn about. This month we're learning about social news sites like Dig and Reddit, things like that. Um, you can also read a book every month. We suggest a book title, something that is related to libraries or librarianship. You can do that. If you are a Nebraska library, a public library, you can earn continuing education credits for doing these things. Um, to the program. If you're not a Nebraska public library, check with whoever submits um, gives you your continuing education credits and they might um, agree to do these um, as well if you actually participate in our program here you could possibly earn credits on your side um, so 
that is it. Oh, also, um, just a last final thing, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are um, a Facebook user, let me get down here, um, please like us on Facebook and you'll get notifications of when new episodes up, when the recordings are available, anything related to some of our shows we'll put here on the website. Um, it, we, you know, it's posted up onto our Facebook page as well as on our website. So thank you very much for attending, and that will wrap it up for us. Uh, a few more little nice thank yous coming through. Very interesting, good resources. Good job, Bridget and Wendy. Thank you so much for being on the show. So hopefully we'll see you next week at 9 a.m. Central Time for Encompass Live. Thanks. <laughs>